Well, come on, let's give the Lord praise. We're so excited to be in the house of God one more time. Look at how good our God is. He allowed us to join together from right where you are to right where we are on a Wednesday to give our God praise. How many of you know our God is just as good on Wednesday as he is on Sunday? So we come to lift the name of Jesus on high. Somebody right where you are, just shout Jesus. Just shout Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's sing, as we love on you, receive our love, receive our love, and as we shout your name, receive our praises, receive our praises. Let's sing, as we love, as we love on you. To be praised. We lift your name. We lift your name. Come on. Clap your hands. Uh, open up your mouth. Uh, give God praise uh, right where you are. Hallelujah. Let's sing it one more time. Say, as we love on you, receive. Receive our love, receive our love, say as we shout, your name, receive our praises, receive our praises, say your name, be glorified, there's no other name, no other name, no other name like yours. Let's sing that one more time. You're great and greatly to be praised. One more time. So your name is high. Be glorified. There's no other name. Hey, no other name. So your name is high. Be glorified. You are great. You are great, God, and greatly to be praised. your voice now. Open it up now and give our praise. Come on everyone, right where you are, you can find a praise and just lift up the name of Jesus as we declare to him today. Say no one is greater than now. Say no one is greater. Your strength is greater than now. Say no one So your love is greater than now. So no one is greater. Your strength is greater than now. So no one greater. One more time. Your love is greater than now. So no one is greater. Your strength. It's greater than ours. Say no one is greater. Say no one is greater. No one greater. Say no one greater. No one greater. Say your love is greater than. 
in the house. Say no one greater. Your strength is greater than ours. Say no one greater. One more time. Say your love is greater than ours. Say no one greater. Well, this is the day the Lord has made and we're here to rejoice and be glad in it. It's so good to have you here and welcome you to our noonday Bible study as presented through the House of Hope Atlanta and the Hope TV. I'm certainly appreciative to each of you for tuning in today and I want you to know that there's no one greater than our God. I want to thank Minister Greg and Minister Mignon for leading us with our praise team and worship today to remind us that God is greater than any other God, and not only that God is greater than any other force. Please understand that COVID-19 is great. It's a great virus that has power, but it's not greater than God. It's not more powerful than God. Please know our governmental officials and governmental agencies, they do have power. They are great, but they're not greater than God. And because our God is a great God, he's great to be praised. If he was an average God, he'd deserve average praise. And if he was a mediocre God, he'd deserve mediocre praise. But because our God is a great God, he is greatly to be praised. And I greet you in the name of our matchless Messiah today. I pray you've been blessed today uh, through the worship thus far. And I also pray that you've been blessed by the programming that's coming through the Hope, the Hope TV, which is an outreach arm of House of Hope Atlanta. As a matter of fact, uh, we've been doing media for a long time. I've been doing media all my life, actually. Grew up as a kid, a cameraman in my dad's church, and so developed a little affinity and love for media as a kid. I've been doing it all my life, one of the gifts that God gave me, uh, from producing to writing to putting it together, and uh, so it's been a very active part of my life, and I'm so humbled that God would give me that gift, and uh, even, even so uh, I'm more appreciative that our church would embrace that, and now so flagship ministers of our church, our media and uh, marketing ministries, flagship ministers of our church, and we've been blessed to bring you programming down through the years, but we've ramped up our efforts the last couple of weeks as a result of COVID-19. And so on March 19th, we did our first webinar, which arguably one of the amongst the first in faith-based community, uh, talking about pastoring in a pandemic, 
And since that time, we've come from that one show to now we've got 18 flagship shows that we're offering every week via the Hope TV. And I hope you've been blessed by that. I want you to follow us on all things social media at the Hope TV because it's quality Christian programming. And you also can follow us at the House of Hope Atlanta. Those who've not yet done that, you can follow us on all things social media. House of Hope Atlanta on YouTube. You can subscribe to that page. House of Hope Atlanta on Facebook. Please uh, follow and subscribe to that page. Like it. And you can follow us on Hope, House of Hope ATL on all things social media. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope. Please follow, please follow us there. I want to welcome all of our viewers who are viewing today via Apple TV, Roku TV, now, a new platform that we're excited to, excited to announce, the Twitch platform, which we just started a few days ago, and uh, about a week ago, I think. And so we want to welcome all of our new Twitch followers, those who are following via Twitch, of course, YouTube, Facebook, uh, and also the House of Hope uh, ATL website, the edwissmith.org website, as well as the House of Hope uh, Atlanta app. So uh, if you're able to Subscribe, please subscribe. If you're viewing via a platform that allows you to like the page, I want you to consider liking the page as well as sending the links to people that you know can be impacted and empowered as a result of our programming. You also can follow me on all things social media on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at E. Dewey Smith on um, Facebook, um, and I am the official page of Pastor E. Dewey Smith, and also on YouTube, I'm Dr. E. Dewey Smith page of Dr. E. Dewey Smith. So follow us on all things social media. Stay uh, abreast of what's happening. And while you're watching, drop, drop, drop us a line. Let us know what city, what state you're watching from. Also, let us know the country you're watching from. Uh, we're grateful that we have an international ministry here, an international reach, and literally people all over the world have been moved and empowered by our ministry opportunities. So thank you so very much for your presence, and I appreciate you for your support. Uh, today, we're continuing our study of the book by Richard J. Foster entitled The Celebration of Discipline. It's an amazing book, The Celebration of Discipline. I want you to get that book. Uh, if you've not yet uh, have it, you can uh, get it through ebook. If you want to lo uh, download it to uh, an iPad or a laptop or your cell device, one of the most impactful books that I've read over the past decade. Um, let me tell you something, that book is an amazing piece of literature, and I really want to encourage you to get that because I think it's going to be transformative, and uh, it's, it's just it's a life-changing type of book. And so make sure you get that, The Celebration of Discipline. We're going to put it back on the screen so you can get it, The Celebration of Discipline by Richard J. Foster. Make sure you get it, uh, an amazing book. We've gone through several chapters thus far, and if you if you like to read, please get it, and I promise you, uh, you're going to thank me later once you read that book. Today we're talking about the discipline. And also while I'm at it, um, please know that all of our Bible study outlines are uploaded to our House of Hope uh, Atlanta website. And so you can go to the website right now, uh, houseofhopeatl.org, uh, and you can actually download the website and print it so you can study along with us. We, we put all of our Bible study outlines on the website. You can go to the resources link of the website and get it. And so as we're going through uh, the outline today, you can study along with us, okay? And so I certainly would appreciate you for doing that. So I want to get right into the lesson today. Today we're talking about a powerful lesson. Uh, today's lesson is entitled The Discipline of Confession. And uh, it's an amazing, an amazing transformative chapter. And I hope that you are already. Uh, he, he begins with uh, a quote in the book, and what I just simply did, I just outlined the whole chapter for you and put it in a, in a meaningful form, and a portable form for you. So I think you're going to be really, really blessed by this chapter. Uh, he begins with a quote. I want to be able to begin with a quote by Augustine, the African Archbishop of Hippo. Uh, Augustine was one of the early church fathers. While I'm on that, let me talk about it for a moment. A lot of people don't understand that, but many of the early church fathers were of African descent. Uh, origin and Tertullian, but Augustine is uh, uh, one of the early church fathers of the patristic period. Uh, many of the doctrines that we hold true to our faith right now were in some ways uh, started, uh, popularized, uh, initiated, and sometimes even developed by Augustine, the African Archbishop of Hippo. And so uh, Richard Foster begins with this African quote by Augustine. Sometimes people call him Augustine, but it's really Augustine. 
Uh, but he says it's the, the confession of evil works is the beginning of good works. He talks about the power of confession. And I want to talk about it. And uh, it's very, very important. This is a good book. I believe this is a time for us to really be contemplative, to look at our own lives, and to really help us work through some stuff personally while we're in this quarantine. I think that this quarantine is a time of uh, cont 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 uh, contemplation for us. It's a time of meditation. It's a time of reexamination. It's also a time of purging. Uh, I don't believe that we should come out of this quarantine the same way that we went in it. I don't believe that God allows us to have this much time uh, for, for just any old reason. I believe that what God is doing, even in this season, is God is allowing some certain things to happen for a specific reason. And I believe that even in this moment, it is a time of proof. Let me get to this. He says, uh, con confession and forgiveness are realities that can transform us. I'm going to say that again. Confession and, re and, and forgiveness are realities that can transform us. He says, this is without the cross, confession would only be psychologically therapeutic. That's a great point. Uh, that uh, while confession can help us from a psychological and emotional st standpoint, that through confession, uh, we can find therapy emotionally, mentally, psychologically. He says, uh, so, but that's even without the cross. So confession, he says, really can, can help us psychologically, but it's only psychologically therapeutic. It's only mentally or emotionally therapeutic. Now you add the cross with confession, <laughs> it takes you to a whole nother level. So the cross and confession takes a whole nother level. Listen to this. Confession involves an objective change in our relationship with God. Con confession. It involves an objective change, not something that's subjective, but that when we really confess to God, that it can bring about an objective change in us, uh, in our relationship with God, and a more subjective change in us. So when that's true confession, we can see an objective change with us in God, but also a subjective change within our own lives. He says this very important. Confession is a means of healing and transforming the inner spirit. That through the power of confession, it can bring healing and bring transformation of the inner spirit. That's a powerful word. That through confession, it can bring about healing and transformation of the inner, what's inside of us. Some things can be uh, changed and transformed. And then he says, confession is a grace as well as a spiritual discipline. It's a grace as well as a discipline. It's a grace as well as a discipline. Now, now this is what Richard Foster says in the book. I want to make sure you hear this. Confession is a difficult discipline for us because we all too often view the believing community as a fellowship of saints before we see it as a fellowship of sinners. Lord have mercy. Confession is difficult. It's difficult for many of us because we are too often, we too often view the believing community as a fellowship of saints before we see it as a fellowship of sinners. That's a, that's a beautiful point, that sometimes people feel so inadequate. I had a conversation with, with a brother yesterday. Um, we was on our Marriage Matters uh, broadcast last night, and one of our members, Brian, said, he said, Pastor, I, I really didn't even want to, when the first time when I heard you preach on the broadcast, TV broadcast, I was sitting with my wife. He said, I didn't want to go to church because I didn't think I was even worthy to be in church. And... Um, and and I was talking to somebody earlier and said, Pastor, I want to have a conversation with you, but I didn't feel I would, I feel like I didn't feel adequate enough to have a conversation with you. And it makes you wonder what makes us think that um, because people are in the church and because you see a church that you feel inadequate in even going or feel inadequate in even having a conversation with a man or woman of God. And that and that's just that was very, very telling because what it says to many of us. Is, is because in our lenses we see people and we see the church as a fellowship of saints versus a fellowship of sinners. That's an important point because the church is not a haven for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And the challenge with us, I think, and this is why I'm so adamant about not trying to be judgmental and making sure that we're gracious because unfortunately many people in church, we love to receive grace for ourselves, but we're quick to, to, to throw the law and judgment and legalism at others. And I think you have to be careful about uh, the lenses at which you view other people. 
because whenever you point one finger at somebody else, three more point them back at you. Uh, we're very, very quick uh, sometimes in, in, in ecclesial communities uh, to point out the wrong in others, but sometimes the wrong in ourselves uh, left, it, it left goes on, it left goes on debt with. And that's a very, very important point. And um, what he says is we feel that everyone has advanced so far into holiness that we are isolated and alone in our own sin. And that's so true that we look at other people and we think that so far up the ladder and they've, they've accomplished so much and they've done so much because they've done so much and they've grown so much and they're so holy. And we see them on Sundays and we see them in all these other spectrums and dress well and gifted and with the oratory and walking in power. And we see people walking those gifts that we look at ourselves and we feel isolated in our own sins as if, as if we are less than, or subhuman, or as if these other people are, are much greater than we are because of what we see visibly. But just because you see something visibly being demonstrated as spiritual and, and as powerful does not mean that that person is greater than you are because even the greatest person is not perfect. There was only one man who live on this earth who walked in perfection and he ain't here and his name is Jesus Christ. Are right, you listening to me? And so what happens here, uh, what Richard Foster says, we cannot bear to reveal our failures or our shortcomings to others. And so sometimes what happens in our lives, we're fearful to discuss our issues, especially this is true with men. You know, we, we want to hold in our strength and our weaknesses, whether it be sin or not, you know, just our issues we're dealing with, you know, our struggles, you know, our thoughts. I'm not just talking about sin. It's not just sinful here. Um, you know, Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, we got to lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. Some things are weights, but they're not sins. There's a difference between the weight and the sin. And many of us don't want to bear sharing that. And so we are alone often because we don't want to reveal our failures or our shortcomings to others. Sometimes people struggle with suicidal thoughts and they don't want to share that with others because they're fearful of how people are going to view them. And I want to just talk about that for a moment. It's very, very important. So we cannot bear to reveal our failures or our shortcomings. And here's the reality. All of us will have failures. All of us will have shortcomings. And what Richard Foster says in this chapter is, it's okay. All right. And what he says, first of all, now he says, but I want to deal with the one what he calls with the authority to forgive. It's interesting that in this chapter, he deals with forgiveness and confession. And so he talks about the, the authority to forgive. And in St. John chapter 20, in St. John 20, he talks about the authority to forgive. And that scripture in St. John chapter 20 and, um, and verse number 23, the authority to forgive. We dealt with that last week in that model prayer in Bible study uh, in our morning due and uh, last week about how Jesus prays and, uh, and told us to pray rather. But this is what he says. He says in, in John chapter 20 and in verse number 23, uh, the power to forgive. Uh, listen, listen to what he says. He says, he says, I'm going to give you power, the Holy Spirit. He talks to his disciples. I'm breathing on you. Whoever sins you remit, those sins are, re, are, are remitted unto them. What he basically says is, it's within your auspices. It's within, it's within your purview that you have the power to forgive. That authority is given to you. So 1A, Christ gives you the authority to forgive. And so the power to forgive is given to you. And now did he, he say, I'm giving you the power to give, forgive in John 20, 23. But also he gives us the pattern and that we should pray for forgiveness. In that model prayer, the disciples pray in Luke 11, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. It. So, so I'm giving you power to forgive, but I'm also showing you how to pray for forgiveness. That's in Luke 11. And so Christ gives us authority to forgive. The authority is based on grace and not merit. This is very important. That when you're forgiving, the authority to forgive is not based on merit. It's not based on works. He says that you got to be uh, able to forgive based upon grace. You know, see, God doesn't make us work to get forgiven. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is, it's for by grace are you saved, through faith, not works. See, sometimes in our lives, in human relationships, we make people work before I forgive them. You're wrong, man. You're going to have to do some things. And once you do some things and, and prove your worthiness, then I forgive you. 
you know, if that man messed up and, and did something he wasn't supposed to do, or that woman did something she wasn't supposed to do, then, well, if you buy me flowers, if she cooked me dinners and buy a nice outfit for me and buy me a car, or, you know, or take me to the movies or send me a note, or send me a car, or send some balloons, you know, then I might forgive them. Because you're basing forgiveness on merit and not on grace. Let me tell you something. You all, you and I all be glad that God doesn't make us buy him balloons or send a car or cook a dinner or do that and do this or do that in order to be forgiven. Uh, thank God that even this morning when God rode by in his golden chariot, chauffeured by the invisible winds and dispatched his angel to touch our bodies with a finger of love and our eyes optically came open to greet the virgin light of a brand new day. You know what? God didn't make us work to get grace. He didn't make us work to get that opportunity. My God, this morning he met us and kissed us with a brand new set of mercies. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah says it's because of your faithfulness that we're not consumed. He says, you know, uh, my, when I think about the misery and the wormwood and the gall, I almost lost my mind. He said, but this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. It's because of your mercies that we're not consumed. And so grace and mercy are not a matter of merit. Hallelujah. Forgiveness from God is because of God's love. God, God commended, Paul said in Romans, God expressed his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so God showed his love, not after we had the right merits, not after we worked for it, but he did it. And commended his love that and he sent Jesus that while we're still jacked up and messed up, that Christ died for our sins. You ought to shout hallelujah right there. Uh, because we can't work for God's forgiveness. We can't earn God's love and God's grace. And so here's the reality. And so if God doesn't make us work to earn forgiveness from him, then why should we base uh, forgiveness toward each other off of merit? It's not a matter of merit, he says. It's a matter of grace. Somebody shout grace. Hallelujah. He says, listen, and I, here's a very important point. There is still an efficacy in private confession. I love that. What he says is when you can confess something, that there's power in private confession. That even in the moments of private, well, this is what Richard Foster says, that there is a certain type of efficacy. There's a certain type of power that can come in private confession. When you get it out, when you name that thing, he says there's a power that can come in private confession. Listen, even, even Martin Luther believed in mutual brotherly confession. Martin Luther, the great Reformation theologian, believed in the reality of a brotherly, a mutual confession. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a moment. Now, here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, of the great German thinker, said. Bonhoeffer said, a man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer alone with himself. Let me read that again. A man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer with himself, but he experiences the presence of God in the reality of the other person. Listen to me. Listen very carefully. I'm read that again. This is Dietrich Bonham. I love this quote. A man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer alone. Now, notice what he says. He says a brother. He didn't say a prayer partner. He didn't say on Facebook, he didn't say with somebody that you like, he didn't say get out and bleed and all on all, all on social media or blabbing what's going on in, on your job or just being so emotional that you're not thoughtful. He said, no, no. He said, somebody who does this in the presence of a brother knows that you're no longer alone with yourself because he says, you're gonna experience the presence of God through the other person. As long as I'm by myself in the confession of my sins, it remain, everything remains in the dark. But in the presence of a brother, the sin has to be brought into the light. That's what Bonhoeffer says. So when you're able to go to someone who loves you and cares about you, who understands you, that you can get it out, is in that moment, he says, that you find the power of confession and forgiveness. And there's a power in that because you can experience the presence of God. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. And so that was the authority to forgive. Now he talks about the advice in giving confession. That he gives some advice that when we that when we're going through confession, there's some advice he gives in terms of giving a confession. Listen to what he says. There must be, this is the advice, point two, there must be the examination of conscience. The examination of conscience. 
What that means is I got to look at my own conscience. And I thank God my mother taught me. She said, uh, son, one of the ways that you will know that the Holy Spirit is still working in your life is through your conscience. Now, and we're not talking about consciousness. That's C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S-N-E-S-S. -S -S. That's consciousness. That's, that's thought. But the conscience is that inner thing. It's, it's, it's really, um, it really is related. It has an affinity with the Holy Spirit. That's that thing. The conscious uh, is conscious. If I'm conscious, that means I'm thoughtful. But the conscience is different. C-O-N-S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. What, what, that thing is the thing that says that when you've done or said something wrong, that you can hear a voice. You can, you can feel a certain way that lets you know that you will contribute to the will of God. Uh, when you can do something that's not right, 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 and you can feel God speaking to you and whipping you. And she would always tell me, she said, as long as that conscience is there, that lets you know that the Holy Spirit is still active in your life. But the moment that you lose that consciousness and that conscience, when you don't examine your conscience, uh, if you just can do and be low down and dirty and try to destroy people and try to hurt people just willfully with no regard, because it's what you, that's a person whose conscience has been seared. And when you know people are just demonic and debilitating, they don't care who they hurt, they don't care what they say, they don't care uh, who's offended by it, it's all about what they want. When you know when somebody's destructive, they can do anything and hurt people just willfully and blatantly and try to cause pain and shame and destruction, that's lets you know that person's conscience has been seared. And nothing is more dangerous than a person who can do and say whatever they want to do and the Holy Spirit doesn't convict them in their conscience. And so you and I have to be careful that we don't get so, and it's very important this day because so many people in this day feel like they just can do, do and say what you want to do. You know, YOLO, you only live once. You know, I work hard, I'm gonna play hard. You know, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And, and I think sometimes even when you, the conscience is not just in terms of right and wrong, in terms of sin and good, but I think it just should guide our lives. You know, you can go to the mall and buy something that you know you didn't deserve. And you leave like, why did I buy that? Sometimes we call it buyer's remorse. I, no, it ain't buyer's remorse. That's your conscience. That's the Holy Spirit coming to let you know that what you did wasn't right. And when that happens, what our aim should be to not continue to go down this, that same path that the conscience has just reminded you. And so you got to be careful about that because God knows what's on the inside. And when you can examine the conscience and you know what's going on, that's the very key thing. So he talks about that. He said there must be a godly conscience. What is your conscience saying to you? Sometimes it's tough because sometimes you want to say back, you want to fight back. Sometimes you want to get even. But the moment you take it out of God's hands, hallelujah, the moment you try to handle it on your own is the moment that you, you disinvited God into your situation. Let me tell you something. I've been in some of the worst, I've been in some of the worst situations. I've seen people in the worst situations. And when your conscience doesn't let you sit back and say, I'm going to trust this to God. Because God, I can very easily reach for my mind and my, my Glock. I can very easily get a, get a, get a, go go for my go taekwondo on somebody, but God, let my conscience be saturated with Your Spirit, because I can very easily we can very easily get in the flesh if we want to. It's easy for us to fight uh, eye for an eye. It's easy for us to fight fire with fire. It's easy if we're not careful. If we've been low down and dirty and tried to damage and destroy you, it's easy for you. To, to get down in the gutter with people. But the problem is, when the conscience is not godly, mama once told me, said, son, don't you ever argue with a fool. Because if people in the streets walk by and they see you arguing with a fool, the people won't be able to tell which one is the fool. So sometimes you gotta learn how to take your hands off of it and let people do dirt and put it in God's hands and let God fight the battle. Whether you were right or whether you were wrong, trying to fight the battle on your own, trying to make it right. you got to put it in God's hands and do all you can do to make it right. And once you've done that, you take your hands off of it and say, God, I want you to clean my conscience. Lord, Holy Spirit, keep talking to my conscience. Let that inner voice tell me when I said something I shouldn't have said. 
Let that inner voice keep reminding me when I need to make a phone call to apologize. Let that inner voice keep reminding me and, 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 and put people around me who love me, who know, who can tell me, who, who say, man, d d does your conscience bother you? You know, sometimes people say, how can you sleep at night? You know, how do you sleep at night? No, well, people don't know your story. But when you're conscious and those who are around you know the story, that's when you know. And I'm, that's very important. And my, my mentor said, man of God, he said, when you're going through something in your life, that's important that you are, that you are always uh, in order with the Lord. When you're in order with the Lord and the Lord knows your situation, you got to be in order with the Lord. He says, number two, be in order with the law. <laughs> because just because, you know, you want to be in order with the Lord. And most time when you're in order with the Lord, you're going to be in order with the law. When you're in order with the Lord, in order with the law, be in order with your loved ones, those who are around you. That's the order. I'm giving this for somebody. How do you know if my conscience is working? How do you know if I'm doing the right thing? Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm operating in a godly conscience, be, order, be in order with the Lord. Be in order with the law. Be in order with your loved ones, those who are around you, those who you know love you and feed into your life and want the best for you. Then be in order with your leaders, the leadership. That's the people who over you. Those are your mentors. That's your boss. That's your family. Those are people. That's your, your pastors, your leaders, your, you know, the person, your supervisors, those to whom you're accountable. He says, and then now you can live. So when you're, so when you're trying to figure out which direction to go, uh, this is the situation I'm in. I messed up. But this is what I'm going through. Or, Pastor, somebody did something to me and I want to get them back. Or, Pastor, I, may, I made a mistake in life and I'm trying to fix it. I'm, and how, how do I make sure my conscience is right? How do I make sure I can sleep at night? All right? What do I do? You be in order with the Lord. You be in order with the law. You be in order with the loved ones. You be in order with your leadership. And, and, and that's a great template and rubric by which you can live your life. You can't be in. You, don't worry about losers. Don't worry about those who are in, in, in left field. You understand what I'm trying to say? Too many of us are trying to respond to people who don't matter. And too many of us have, been, have given lobby level people, concierge and penthouse access into our lives. And, and as a result, you're going to be all over the place. But with your conscience, you want to be godly. Am I right with the Lord? Am I right with the law? Am I right with my loved ones? Am I right with my leaders? And if you are right, and you have had those conversations where you're good with the Lord, you're in order with the law, you're good with your loved ones, you're good with the leaders, then forget about what a loser says. Forget about what folk in left field say. Forget about those who want you to be last and left out say anyway. You have to make sure, we have to make sure in our lives, in every situation, am I right with the Lord? Am I right with the law? Am I right with my loved ones? Am I right with my leaders, right? And then that lets you know whether you how you live. Because see, understand this. When you say, I want to live, right? That's how you live. That's how you have that conscious. I'm, I'm good with the Lord. I'm good with the law. I'm good with my loved ones. I'm good with my leaders. Now you can live. Now the opposite of live is evil. You hear what I just said? The opposite of live is evil. Evil is live spelled backwards. You hear what I just said? I said evil is is live really spell backwards you, you with me and so that's the good point that i want to make but basically that's all it is the same letters that's what i'm trying to say it's the same letters in that word that's what i want you to get okay and so if now that's how you know if my conscience is 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 is, is not appropriate that my conscience is not godly and uh and so is is i'm i good with the lord am i good with the law am i good with my loved ones am i good with my leadership and once you have those things in order, now you can live. It doesn't matter what anybody says. That's a good way to make sure that your conscience is godly. Are y'all with me? All right, I'm going to keep going. I just want to throw that at you because I think it has blessed me in my life. And I want to share it with you because I think it's a good root by which you live. Um, because if not, people have you messed up, okay? And so uh, here's how you, here's how you, the good advice of, uh, this is how the advice of, 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 of uh, in the giving of, a, of confession. I'm going to examine my conscience must be a godly conscience that must be a termination to avoid sin and so once i have i, I made it my seat i made a decision pastor this is the direction i want to go in now i have to determine in myself that some stuff i need to avoid i got don't put myself in any situation that i know can be sinful 
whether that's sin with how you talk, whether that's sin of, of, of anger, of iniquity, whether that sin is, is transgression, if it's iniquity, is, if, it's, if it's blasphemy, if that sin is a sin of the flesh, if that sin is a sin of pride, envy, jealousy, well, I'm trying to destroy somebody, huh? In my mind at that moment, I have to say, God, now let me live by avoiding anything that may be sinful. Because sometimes we think that sin is just based on drinking. If, if it's sexual or drinking or smoking, we think that's all the sin. Cussing, drinking, smoking. Cussing, drinking, sexual or smoking. We think that's all the sin. We don't realize, and then we categorize sin. But sin could be wanting to, wanting to fight somebody. Sin could be wanting to take somebody out. And so that's why you have to make sure that you make sure that you govern yourself uh, accordingly and determine how do I avoid anything that's going to put me at odds with the will of God. Listen, confession isn't the permanent habit of self-condemnation. Let me say this to you as well. This is very, very important for our emotional health. Just because you made a mistake in your life, I want you to hear this and take it, somebody, take it from somebody who's made many. Not just before I got saved. Not just before I became a pastor, not just not just before I started to preach the gospel, not just in my twenties and my thirties or my teens, but I'm talking about in my in my forties. Not just yet, not just in yesteryear, huh? Not just in twenty years ago, but I'm talking about in in in, in recent years, huh? Last year, somebody talked to me here. Somebody, just because you've grown, does not mean that you're perfect. And, this, and the last thing I want to say about this, and here's the point, and just because you confess, that does not mean you live your life in a state, what he calls it, I like it, of permanent self-condemnation. What the devil wants to do to you is to let your embarrassment and your shame and your pain beat you down so much where well, it won't make you not even want to live. I've been in some stuff, I've seen some stuff in life, in my own life and so many others over the past 30 years of pastoring people, that people, they die spiritually, mentally, emotionally because they can't get over self-condemnation because they continue to kill themselves and they allow what losers say to make them think that they're less than. Let me tell you something. When God has a call on your life, when God loves you, when God has brought you to where you are, you don't have to live your life trying to meet the expectations of other people. And the greatest thing you can do is you got to learn how to forgive yourself. And once you've forgiven yourself and see yourself as blood washed, hallelujah, that you've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And when the Lord has redeemed you, when the Lord has changed you, when you have been down and, and made error and made mistakes and you've come to God in godly confession and repentance and told God you're sorry. And when you got yourself right with the Lord, with the law, with your loved ones and, and those who are your leaders, then you have got to learn, we've got to learn how not to keep beating ourselves up. Some of us right now are still in bondage over stuff we did four and five years ago. Some of us are still in bondage right now because we have not forgiven ourselves for the mistakes we made. And because we haven't forgiven ourselves for the mistakes we made, we still live beneath our privilege as, least, as if our lives stopped the moment. And we keep talking about it. We keep living back there. We can't get beyond those moments. And what he says here, he says that just because you have had confession, that does not mean that you live the rest of your life in self-condemnation. Listen, there are too many other people in the world who are going to permanently self-condemn you. And, and here's the irony, you know, uh, the, 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 old, the old verse talked about when we come to God, how he throws our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. But you know what I found out? That when we go to God and go to God right, God throws into the sea of forgiveness. But you will always have a joke about a fish, about, a, about the sea with a fishing pole, trying to fish up. Because, and most times people do that because they don't like themselves. So what you find, a lot of people, have you ever met people, if you're talking good about somebody, they're such good people, yeah, but, 
you know what? Yeah, you know, they was they man, they're such a powerful person. Yeah, but you should have seen them in high school. When people always do that, that's a sign of a person who doesn't like themselves. And people who don't like themselves can't see other people being elevated. So all, they always got to lower other people to make themselves feel better. But when you are right with the Lord, you're in order with the law, you're good with your loved ones, and you're right with your leadership at the same time, then don't live your life in self-confession and self-condemnation. Get up from whatever mistakes you made. Get up from whatever you did that were outside the will of God. Get up from it. Don't spend your life judging and condemning yourself. You know what the thief said to Jesus on the cross? He said, Lord, listen, we, we are in this shape because we did wrong, but do me a favor. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus looked at him and said, Verily I said unto you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. I don't hold your sins against you. I'm throwing them into the sea of forgiveness. Your sins don't stop you from being a part of my majestic supernatural power. Hallelujah. Sin left the crimson stain, but he's going to wash it. Uh, that's power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And, and when God has purged you with his blood and washed you, got to sit like David, created me a clean heart. Oh, God, I renew within me a right spirit. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And I'm here to tell you that he'll give you your joy back. I'm here to tell you I've been through some things that made me think, wonder, could I live? Could I make it through it? But by the grace and power of God, when the Holy Spirit comes to tell you, do it, get right with the Lord. Make sure you're right with the Lord. Get right with your loved ones and get right with your leadership. Once you do that, you can live. And child of God, I don't know who I'm talking to. Some of you got a criminal record. Or some of you made some mistakes in college. Help me somebody. Some of you stole drugs. Some of you went through some things that caused your marriage to dissolve. My God, some of you said some things that were harmful to people. Some of you did some damage and some dirt to people. You stole. You, you, some, some of you went through some things. Some of you were molested. My God, and you've been living your life still holding on now to what happened then. Let me tell you this. I came to tell you, don't live your life in self-condemnation. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Hold your head up. My God, I realize there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood and lose all their guilty stains. Come on, let him, let him lose your guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, just as vile, go vile as he, wash all my sins away. You ought to thank God right now that there's still a fountain. And it's filled with blood, y'all. And you plunge beneath that flood and lose your guilty stains. Stop letting, my God, when the God has set you free, stop living in bondage. Stop living in bondage. Hold your head up. Put it in God's hands. Whatever's wrong, God going to fix it. Whatever out of order, God going to make it in order. God don't need your help. You do your part, but stop living in self. Let me keep going because I'm getting happy right here by myself. Don't, don't, don't live your life. It's not the permanent habit of self-condemnation. Now, here's 2E. Here's some advice. I love this. I love this. He gives, he gives some advice on when you confess. Now, listen very carefully. When confessing to someone, listen very carefully. When confessing to somebody, this is from the book. When confessing to someone, make sure they have the following qualifications. If you're going to confess to somebody, here's the qualification. Number one, spiritual maturity. Right there, most of us who confess to people, they're messed up from the very start. That when you're confessing to somebody, how are you confessing your sin to somebody who ain't mature? Doesn't make sense. You killed yourself from the very beginning. So he said they need, they need to be spiritual mature. Then they have wisdom. My God. Then they have compassion. They need good common sense. Lord have mercy. And we can tell you through this pandemic, some folks ain't got good common sense. I wish y'all talked to me on this internet. They have the ability to keep a confidence. We confess to people who can't keep a confidence. And, and you, you tell, and, here's how, and here's how you know who to confess to. If you're talking to somebody and that person always bringing you somebody else's business. If you're talking to somebody and they always talking about other people. For the life of me, I understand. Why would you confess to somebody you know always gossips? That makes sense. It doesn't it's, 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 it make sense. Because mama said any dog will bring a bone. Hello? 
will take them all. So you got to have somebody good common sense, the ability to keep the confidence, and then lastly, a wholesome sense of humor. You need somebody who can laugh with you. Because the world wants to laugh at you. The world wants to destroy you. But need somebody who can help you get through it by having a, this. Those are some good qualities. We'll go through them again. Listen, if you're going to confess to somebody, make sure they have the following qualifications. Spiritual maturity. Wisdom. Somebody who's been through some things. Look at their life. What I confess to you in your life, right? What I confess to you, can you really help me? Wisdom is the ability to appropriate knowledge. Look at them. We, we, tell, we talk to people who, who, who just as ragged and messed up as we are. You need somebody who has some mature, maturity, wisdom, compassion. Because you can confess with somebody when you're broken and you're vulnerable, and that person can wound you to the point where you never get back up from it. So they, they need some spiritual maturity, wisdom, compassion, good common sense. To tell you how to navigate when you're broken, when you're vulnerable. Some people will leave you, push you out the wrong way in your mess and your brokenness, and it can be irretrievably broken. Some people that you can tell your stuff to and get your stuff can push you out there where it causes irreparable harm. Where something can never be repaired because of the people you had in your life. Because you had people who didn't lead you to wisdom. They push you out there sometimes for their own selfish and sinful agendas. And it can never be repaired because you got with the wrong people. I, I've seen that in my own life and seen with so many other people. The ability to keep a confidence and a good wholesome sense of humor. This is what he says right here. This is what he said. This is what Martin Luther said. Uh, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. What a problem. What a, what a, what a statement. Martin Luther said, give me 100 preachers, 100, who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of God on earth. All right. So I gave you number one, which was the authority to forgive. Then, then the advice in giving a confession. And here is the, the counsel. In the receiving of a confession all right so when you've got the right people that's why you got to be prayerful about when it's time to confess and that, that's some scriptures that that they put on the outline i'm gonna hopefully i have time to read them but i'm trying to get through all this in an hour here's the counsel so when you got to confess something uh when you gotta you need to get some off you you know people right now maybe there was some, some suicidal thoughts and again this is not always a confession is in sin it could be broken it could my, my marriage my you know, somebody said, Pastor, uh, my, my son is on drugs or whatever it may be. Something you got to share and get it off of you, that trauma off of you. Here is what, here's the counsel, right? And uh, here's the attitude. Here's the word. It should be the attitude in receiving confession. Uh, so, uh, and, and attitude, okay? So we must be prepared to rightly hear the confession of a person. So if you're not, so if, if I'm trying to receive it, and here's when somebody's confessing, confessing to you. You got to have the right attitude. Your mentality has to be right. You know, are you in a position to receive it at the time? Because if not, if you don't receive it right, you can break down, right? B, we must learn to live under the cross. Hallelujah. Under the cross. Under the cross. Not under your critics. Under the cross. Not under folks who, 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 who need you broken to make them feel better. Under the cross. Not on the evil people who want to just get even because they didn't, couldn't get what they wanted from your life. But under the cross. Under the cross. Uh, at last and did my Savior bleed. Here's a quote. Listen. And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Huh? But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. You understand that? I'm indebted. I'm a worm. But because he went to the cross and died for me. At the cross. At the cross. Where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I'm happy all day. That's because you got to be at the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. And when you're at the foot. When you're living under the cross. Not the expectations of people, not your sin, not your agony, not your iniquity, not the things you did wrong. But you and I got to learn to live under the cross. Let me tell you so much. If we don't live under the cross, you can become so caught up in your self-condemnation and your pain and, 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 and the anger and the hurt and insecurities and your wounds and the trauma that you don't see the blessings of confession or the cross. 
My God, and the enemy wants to keep you so bound that you'll take yourself out. But if you live at the foot under the cross, that's power at that cross. Hallelujah. That's redemption at the cross. Clearly, used to sing a song, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. For you, you may be high, you may be low, some are rich, some are poor, but there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. You may be black, you may be white, but all souls are precious in my God's sight. There's room at the cross for you. There's room for the preacher, there's room for the bishop, there's room for the deacon, there's room for the elder, there's room for the apostle, there's room for the prophet, the missionary, there's room for the licentiate, there's room for the deaconess, the steward, the stewardess, there's room for the brother, the sister, there's room for the saved, the unsaved, the tall, there's room for you. Hallelujah. At the cross for you. Uh, so you got to be understanding. So when I'm, when I'm hearing the confession, uh, I got to make sure that I keep myself under the cross. Because if somebody's telling you something, uh, if you're not careful, you can forget that you too need the blood. And so when people are telling you something, before you go to point your finger and tell them how stupid and woe is them and they're going to hell, make sure that you yourself remember that the same grace that the person who's confessing to you, that you in need of that same grace. Hallelujah. We all live at the foot of the cross. Listen, see, be prepared to hear the worst things from the best people. I've learned just because you are a leader, just because you are awesome and all that does not mean, listen, there's some good in the worst of us and there's some bad in the best of us. Even some of the best people have some demons and have some battles and some stuff that they've gone through in their lives that they're ashamed to tell. And so when somebody's telling you, don't ever think that because of their position or how long they've been saved or who they are, that the enemy don't attack them. Let me tell you something. I found out that sometimes the ones that God uses the most are the ones who have to go through the most attack. And let me tell you why. And I found it out. It's because a lot of times I know that the attacks of God, I know God, I know God got a great call on my life. I know God has gifted me. I know God has called me to preach the gospel. And I know that a lot of the attacks in my life, a lot of things I've got myself into, a lot of things that have come my way. And I've, I feel like, I realize this. It's because the devil, it ain't cause of me. It's because the devil wants to get my voice. Because if I can kill him, if I can destroy him and take his voice, then the gospel and the word that God put in his mouth won't be able to be proclaimed. The devil knows that every time I open my voice, God can use my voice and my gifts to bring people to him. The devil knows that every time I stand and out the pulpit and open the book, that, that, that the devil gets nervous that was snatching souls from the kingdom of hell. So what he can do is try to get you destroyed and get you uh, in self-condemnation and get you in your sin and get you in your carnality and get you in your shame and uh, aloneness to make you dissolve and to make you come to the where you devolve and stop being because you because he wants to take your voice. Because he realizes if I can hush your voice, then that's, that's, that's one less weapon in the kingdom of God. And that's what he wants. He wants your testimony to embarrass you and shame you, to take your voice so you can't have a testimony to, to speak about the Lord. But you got to tell him, you ain't taking my voice. And so today when people come to you, I don't care who you are, how good you are, give people room to come and share with you that stuff. And don't judge them. Don't condemn them. And how do you do that? Because you got to make sure that you remember in loving kindness have, have I drawn thee. And the same measure you use to bring people in is the same. That's why I always try to be gracious. People, anybody who know me, I ain't never been no judgmental guy. Because guess what? Because the same grace that you extend to others, be careful. You yourself may one day need that same grace. Be careful how you treat people, all right? So be prepared to hear the worst things for people. Uh, D, be delivered from the danger of spiritual domination. What a good point. Some people want to spiritually dominate you. When you're down and they messed up, they want to act as if they are some authority and they have something. They want to come and dump. Be careful about that. Be careful that, that when people come to you and tell you their brokenness and their stories and their sins and their struggles, that you don't get this hierarchy where there's superiority and inferiority. 
No, 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 no. There's room for all of us at the cross. Just because somebody, just because you ain't told them your stuff, don't mean you ain't got nothing. And don't, and just because you have may not have done that, you've done something. We love to talk about what we don't do, but there's some things in all of our lives. And here's another thing I've discovered too. We, we love to talk about things I used to do I don't do no more. Well, for some of us, it ain't that you don't do no more. You can't. <laughs> oh yeah, some of us you still be doing it. It's just authorized and caught up with you. Come on here, help me somebody. Uh, some of you you still would, you still would do it if you could. You just can't dance and move like you used to without an oxygen tank. I wish I had somebody help me here. Oh, you still would do it. My God, just your body won't let you do it no more. Oh my God, some of you. So don't act like you just got saved. Some of you didn't get delivered. Oh, I, you know, Satan had me bound. I got away. Some of us didn't get delivered. You just got old. <laughs> Am I telling the truth here? Uh, so old age saved you, not not your spirituality. So come on, please. So don't get so hierarchical now, and you're spiritually dominating people because I'm great and I'm wonderful. I'm fabulous. You'd be doing the same thing if you're in the same boat and had the same age and same and same energy. Some folks just got old. You didn't get delivered. Now tweet that, Facebook that. Am I telling the truth? So please be careful. Your grand your grandchild come talk to you and no you may not you may not understand uh, the Migos and Cardi B yeah I understand that yeah what the, what's she saying Cardi B you don't understand the three Migos the, the, the Migos no but you understand the Temptation no you don't understand Cardi B but you understand Millie Jackson huh look how you looking at me now yeah you don't understand Beyonce but you remember Betty Wright I wish I had somebody on this Al Gore's internet to talk to this preacher here. So just like it took time for you to get where you are, it's going to take the young people time to get where they need to be. So don't be no spiritual dominator because you have grown. Now you're better than everybody else. The devil is a lie. My God, we all need grace. Matter of fact, I discovered that old rats like cheese too every now and then. Come on, tweet that right there while you're watching, all right? So so don't be spiritually dominating people uh, when they come to you and stuff. E, when people are opening their griefs to us, be silent. When people are talking and sharing, Learn how to sit back and say nothing. Let people express themselves freely without you butting in. Don't say a word. You might, you don't be making all these expressions. And that's a good lesson too for parents who are talking to teenage kids. One of the greatest lessons that I think I can teach and share with people who have teenage children. When your teenagers are telling you stuff about their lives, the best thing you can do is never be shaken. No show, no emotion. They tell you something that make you want to cry and jump off, the, your, your, jump off your, your deck. But, but the moment you show emotion is the moment they, that they can't talk to you no more. Some of the teenagers can't talk to their parents. Some teachers can't talk to their parents because they know their parents going to go haywire and, and react crazy. And so some of you wonder why my child doesn't talk to me because they know you can't handle it. You're going to be so emotional. You're going to judge them. You're going So they don't say nothing. So they got to find somebody to talk to who's not going to be less judgmental, who's going to understand and help them walk through it. Versus condemning them. So if you if you got a young adult or a teenager and you watch it, maybe your grandchild or your child, when they tell you something, sit, just be quiet. Let them unpress, right? Make, ooh, make faith, make, make faith. Oh, child, oh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Right there, you automatically close the line of communication. You got to pray before they talk to you. And if you're not that frame of line, Lord, please let me just get my mind right because I don't know what they're going to say. But the worst thing you can do is jump overboard. Because the moment you do that is a moment that line of communication and they will never feel comfortable telling you anything else about them. And it's sad when they got to go talk to everybody else because when they need you at 18 years old, they couldn't talk to you because they were afraid you're going to jump off the roof and be so emotional that you couldn't have a moment where you can lead them. And part of the reason why you jump off the roof and the part of the reason why we go crazy is because you stop living on the cross. Part of the reason why we lose our minds is because when you forgot and you didn't tell them the truth about what you did 25 years ago. That's why don't you ever forget where you were. Before you point the bony finger of scrutiny and accusation at those young people and somebody else. It's, it's, it, it, it's, um, it's amazing to me how we love to point fingers at other, other people as if we ain't done nothing. But now we want to be spiritually dominant. Lord have mercy, please. Listen, so please that. So they're telling us be silent. F. Do not pry more details than necessary. So, so, so now, so now when they talk, oh, tell me some more. You know, get bag, bag, bag of popcorn. Like now, now you're not being spiritual. Now you're being nosy and immature, right? So you don't put let them. Don't try to pry. Let them share based on their comfort level. All right. This is what he says in his book. This is a great, great, uh, great, great uh, scripture. 
The discipline of confession brings an end to pretense. Honesty leads to confession and confession leads to change. When somebody's coming to you and you find somebody who's mature, who's compassionate, has a good sense of humor, who can keep a confidence, and you see who has wisdom and you see the love of God in them, he says what happens in that moment is the pretense is over. You ain't got to act like you all this wonderful and fabulous. And that's, that's the greatest lesson I think pastors and all of us can learn. Stop making people think we are more than what we are. That's why I always tell y'all, I am incurably human. That's why I be saying stuff like that to y'all. Some people get mad when I say it. You know, I made a comment last year about Nipsey Hussle and how people, and you know, condemning him. And people, you know, people, people were showing empathy and compassion and broken because he died, right? And I was in a church where a young man had made some mistakes in my, my, my church I uh, planted back home and people were condemning the young man. And I wanted to break that spirit of judgmentalism. And I said, well, people say, why are you following Nipsey Hussle? Because, you know, why y'all feeling sorry for him? He don't love God. He don't do this. And I said, he, he, but God made him too. I made a statement. I said, people said, well, this man smoked marijuana. So, and, I, and, I, and I come in, so folk, men folk in the church drank Hennessy. You know what I mean? They, 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 so why are we condemning this guy? Well, he cussed on his record. How many church folks have said a cuss word? I said that not because I'm trying to justify my behavior of saying I'm doing it. I'm, I'm breaking that up because how hypocritical we can be of people. That's why I tell you all the time, we got to learn to let people know that we need, to, we need grace. I tell people, I've been telling y'all for 30 years, I'm not the Christ. I preach for him, but I'm not him. I didn't die for your sin. If you hit me on one cheek, I'm going to have a, it's very unlikely I'm going to turn the other. Y'all pray for me. He ain't through. He ain't through. I'm telling you, he's not through. If you hit me on one cheek, it's very unlikely I'm not going to turn the other. I'm trying. I'm working hard, but it's very unlikely, right? I am a fighter by nature. I don't bother nobody, but I can't promise you if you hit me on one cheek, I'm going to turn the other, right? Don't let this Reverend Doctor Pastor fool you, right? But he's working on me. But in our lives, we got to be careful that the pretense, because many people can't come with us and have those conversations coming too pretentious, like we're always there, we've always arrived. And when you get rid of pretense, uh, it, you can be honest, it leads to confession, it leads to change. One more quote, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody who lives beneath the cross and who has discerned in the cross of Jesus Christ the utter wickedness of all men and of his own heart will find there is no sin that can ever be alien to him. Lord have mercy. Let me say that again. Anyone who lives beneath the cross has discerned the cross of Jesus. The utter wickedness that's in all of us that can be in our hearts will find there's no sin that you can't do. Right? Stop saying what you want to do. You don't know what you do given the right circumstances. Anybody who has been once horrified by the dreadfulness of his own sins that Jesus nailed to the cross will no longer be horrified by even the rankest sins of a brother. So he says, this is how says, so when you know the stuff that God took for your life, the stuff that Jesus did for you and took to the cross, then you should not be judgmental or horrified if you hear what your brother or your sister has done. So the same grace that he took, your sins and nailed it, is the same graciousness you all apply to other people's lives. And it's amazing how many of us would rather talk about people's sin than talk about our Savior. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and here's the reality. We all need grace. We all need grace. And what I'm telling you here today, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ died. The Bible says in James that if you confess your faults to one another, you can be healed. Some things don't have to be told to everybody. Everybody don't have to know your business. Everybody don't. You got to make sure. Here's what my mentor told me. And I, live my, I live by it. Do it or you right with the Lord. Are you right? Are you in order with the law? Is all well with your loved ones, your family, those who love you, right? And are you right with your leaderships, those to whom you are accountable? And if you in order, if you are good and open with the law, with the law, the law, your loved ones and your leaders, then you can live. And the day I came with a word to somebody to tell you is to live. Look up and live, child of God. My God. I come against suicidal thoughts. I come against self-condemnation. I, I know some folks feel broken, feel like you can't make it right now. Some people are, are, are going crazy right now, about to lose it because they don't know what to do in this pandemic. Now, people, I've been talking to a few 
who, 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 pastor, I can't take care of my family. Confess that. That's not a sin you feel that way. I, I feel I'm about to lose it, pastor. I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Confess it. I'm broken. Confess it. I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen with this pandemic. Find somebody and share it. Don't, don't, you ain't got to bleed out on Facebook. Everybody ain't got to know your business. The Lord, the law, your loved ones, and your leadership. And once you get that right, live. Live and know that you can have freedom. And I came to pronounce freedom over your life right now. Healing over your life right now. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. Praise, praise the Lord. You don't have to tell everybody your business in your life. You don't have to go out there. You ain't got to blab it everywhere, man, but go find somebody. Find your therapist. Find somebody. You can share your deepest struggles and pains and sins and iniquity with. And when you do that and get right with the Lord, your loved ones, the law, and your leadership, live. Live. Don't do yourself no harm. Don't do harm to others. You ain't got to destroy nobody else. It's not about the destruction of others. It's about your own development. And I'm here to tell you, God's going to bring you freedom. I shout, you're going to live. You're going to live and, and not die and declare the works of the Lord. My God, the devil, the devil wants to do you like they tried to do Lazarus in John chapter 12. Lazarus had been dead and Jesus raised him from the dead. But the problem is every time somebody saw Lazarus, they start believing on Jesus. So the church folk from Jerusalem got mad and wanted to kill Lazarus. Why? Because every time they looked at Lazarus, somebody believed on Jesus. That's why people are trying to kill you. That's why self-condemnation is trying to kill you. Because God knows and the devil knows when you come out of this, your life and your testimony are going to be so strong that people are going to look at you and believe God had to have done it. Let me tell you something. I've been through some stuff that people have wondered how he's going to survive it. How are you going to make it? How are you going to pass that 19? How are you going to buy a church, a million dollar church at 23 years of age? Are you listening to me? How are you going to survive it? How are you going to lose every, move away from everything and move to Atlanta and leave a church of 4,000 members and go to four, four, 500? How are you going to lose half his salary? I, I've been through so much good and bad. But let me tell you something. But when you're right with the law, the Lord, your loved ones, and your leaders, you can live. It doesn't matter what the people have said or how many darts have thrown been thrown at you or what you think about yourself when God got a purpose over your life all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose so I came to tell you you're going to live today God's going to give you somebody who you can decompress you can share with a therapist the law your loved ones your leaders you're going to be right with the law you'll be right with the Lord and you're going to live today because if God be for you Oh, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Somebody share right now, I'm going to live. Somebody say right now, I'm going to live. Somebody say right now, my best days are ahead of me. I'm going to live. Yes, been broken. Yes, been through the fire. Yes, been through the flood. Say lightning flashing from above. But through it all, I remember that he loves me and he cares. And he has never put more on me. Never put more on me than you can bear. Because when you can't bear it, what he'll do, he'll get underneath the load with you. He's already given you a way of escape. You coming out of this. Yes, you are. You coming out of this. And when you come out, lift your hand and say, if it had not been. Yes, pastor, I did it. Yes, pastor, I made mistakes. I've been broken. I've been sinful. I've been suicidal. I've been on the verge of giving up. Wanted to leave my family. Wanted to walk out. Wanted Cal going to take me away. It was like David giving the wings so I can be I got the wings of a dove. I can fly away and be at rest. Just want to leave it all. But guess because you stayed ahead on to your faith, God's going to give you double for your trouble. Double is coming your way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let it change you and don't go back. And once he delivers you from it, don't go back. Don't let him bring you back. I declare I ain't going back. I declare I'm not going back. I'm not going. I don't want to be a. I'm not going back to that foolishness. I'm not. I'm not going back. If it if it's destroying your peace, my mind. If it's destroying your peace, if you know it's trying to destroy your life, why you go back to something that you know it never destroyed? It's the devil, and you ain't got to go back to it. Be right with the Lord, the law, your loved ones, and your leaders, and live. Pray that God will put people in your life 
who can be intercessors and not instigators. I'm going to say one more time. Pray that God will put people in your life who can be intercessors and not inter instigators. Intercessors, not instigators. And he's going to let you free yourself and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, I hope you've been blessed by it. Healing is coming right now. Healing is going to come. Somebody's watching me right now and I can see your tears flowing. It's okay. Tears, is that's simply the soul cleansing itself. Let your soul cleanse itself while you're watching. It's okay. And you ain't got you you to stop letting it flow. You ain't got to stop it. No. Stop it means you don't want the soul to be cleansed. Tears, simply, that's the soul's way of cleansing itself. Let the soul, let it cleanse. Get a good rinse. Let that soul cleanse itself. But whatever you do, you're not going back. You're going to live. Be right with the law. Be right with the Lord. Be right with your loved ones. Be right with your leadership. And then you can live. I don't care what you've done. Be right with the Lord. Be right with the law. Be right with your loved ones. Be right with your leaders. And you can live. One more time. I don't care how bad it has been. Get right with the Lord. Get right with the law. Be right with your loved ones. Be right with your leaders. And now you can live. And watch God cleanse you. My friends, I hope you've been blessed. If you got a prayer request, I want to pray with you now. Uh, we're praying every day at 7, noon, and 7 p.m. And uh, you can text the information, the keyword prayer. The information is on your screen right now. You can text it right now. You can text that keyword to prayer while you're watching now. Some of you, you can text your prayer request. You know, if you're watching on Facebook, you can text your prayer request there. Or YouTube, you can text with you. And you, and you got to say everything. Just pray for my family. Pray for peace. Pray for my marriage. Pray for my health. Pray for my finance. Pray for my mind. Pray for my body. You can text that right there as well. But I want you, if I prefer you text it to that uh, prayer, uh, that, that keyword prayer. But if you but if you text it in the Facebook community, others can pray with you. But I prefer you text it there as well so we can add it to our prayer list. Hope you've been blessed. Hope you've been blessed. Now, um, and, and I want you to know that the church is here for you. And, uh, and whatever we can do to, to assist you in this time. Listen, some of you, uh, may want to give. I wanna, I'm going to give an opportunity to give right now. And it's offering time. And the Bible says if you taught the word of God, you are communicating all good things with the one who teaches. And although our church doors are closed, the church ain't closed. Our church building is closed, but our church is not. Uh, Lord, I'm working harder now than I was working <laughs> before the pandemic. Uh, everybody, my staff, I mean, listen, because I know this is a critical time. And we work, I go to bed, I'm, I'm working 18, 20 hours a day. And, uh, but I know we got to do it because it's a critical time on the front lines working, uh, not just in production, but in pastoring people and giving advice and doing all kinds of interviews all over the world uh, every day. So it's a lot. And we need your, we need your support. Uh, we've been feeding our senior citizens and our first responders, and you'll hear more about that. We're doing some more. But I want you to give. You can text to give. You can send through Cash App. Those of you who are old timers and old schoolers like me, some of you in your 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, and you may prefer to, to mail in. But that's some 70 years old, who, 70 year olds who know how to, to give through the phone. And, and I've learned how to do that. And you know, under me has been given mine through the phone. I don't, you know, and uh, so I'm, I'm growing. And we have a very safe, it's very safe and very secure process. And uh, so if you want to give by cash out, a give by text to give is very, very safe, very, very secure. Very safe, very secure. It just, you know, we get used to us. We get, as I said back on, we get sot in our ways. It's going to be set in the ways. We get sot in our ways. You know what I mean? And uh, But it's very secure and it's very easy and it goes right into the, the account. Uh, but if you just prefer to mail it in, then there's a P.O. box uh, that you can mail your tithes and offerings to as well. I hope you've been blessed by this Bible study today. Uh, you can, if you want to mail it in, write your checks. Uh, that's the information right there. Great Travelers Rest, the P.O. box is there. If you want to choose to do that, you can do so. Uh, I just want you to know that you're going to live today. You're going to live today. I speak into your life. I decree and declare you're going to live. You're going to live because you're on the cross. Hallelujah. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith 
I receive, I receive my sign. And now I'm happy all the day. Be happy. Confess it. Get right with the Lord, your loved one, the law, your loved ones, and your leadership. And now you can live. God's gonna put somebody mature, spiritual, and keep a confidence, kind of consider common sense and a good sense of humor with wisdom in your life. And you're gonna find healing. And God's gonna let you be the sounding board so somebody can come and share with you. When they do it, when somebody comes with you with the worst situation, show love, stay at the cross, and be for them what Jesus Christ was for you when you went to him. I hope you've been blessed by this Bible study. Got a little, got to go now, but as always, remember this. If you'll be good to God, God will be good to you. Until next time, take care. Peace.